Hello and welcome back to my Bible study. As you can see, I'm in my RV. Um, I've been traveling for the last two weeks and I'm headed back south to my home. And I had some incidents that happened to me on this particular trip. Uh, some things that I think God was showing me uh, in the spiritual realm and I will talk about those in a future video. We're going to be in this week Exodus 33, 34 and 35. Well, let's talk about last week. Last week um, by the way, I just want you to know it's super hot here, so I do have a fan. I do have my microphone here. I hope you're not getting a lot of noise, but it is super hot. It's muggy. It's on the way down to uh, Florida, so it is going to be pretty hot here right now. So with that, I hope you can bear with me as I'm bearing to film in this weather as well. So last week we learned that the Israelites had built a golden calf as an idol to worship. They said that it was to worship with alongside with God but that's not what God wants Moses had to intercede for them because their punishment was going to be death because of the sin that they committed which is a violation of the Ten Commandments God was very strict with them about that so Moses did a good job interceding for the people and convincing God of the promise that he had for everybody and this is why we're here now in chapter 33 and 34. God is a loving God. He's a merciful God. And he offers grace to those who are willing to live in faith that he is going to give it to them. They're going to receive it and they're going to walk in obedience to God. So with that said, let's get to chapter 33 this week in the Bible. Chapter 33, verse number one. And the Lord said unto Moses, depart and go up hence thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt unto the land which I swear unto Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob saying unto thy seed will I give it so it's obvious here that even after the golden calf incident which really they were sentenced to death considering what God had spoken to them in the past God was still not going to deny the children the promise and uh, this is why we say that he is a merciful God and he's a forgiving God verse number two and I will send an angel before thee and I will drive out the Canaanite the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite the Hivite, and the Jebusite unto a land flowing with milk and honey for I will not go up in the midst of thee for thou art a stiff-necked people lest I consume thee in the way. For my notes are that in this word, God is saying that he won't be too close to them or at least the near sense of his presence because he might decide to judge them along the way. But he is still telling them to go ahead and take the promised land. So I, I'm almost picturing this like anybody of us who have been betrayed that we forgive people but we're also cautious of them the second time around that they don't hurt us again so it almost seems that way to me um, from the way that he's talking about these people here verse number four and when the people heard these evil tidings they mourned and no man did put on him his ornaments so you know when you have somebody who has betrayed you or people who have betrayed you and you talk to them and you know they're going to be, feel remorseful and you're going to see the remorse or you're not going to see the remorse so it's going to give you an indication what type of people these are but if you do see the remorse then you understand that they that they that they really are sorry for what they did and that is exactly what god is looking for us to do in our repentance he wants to see that we're truly sorry and that we do want to be forgiven by him not just words coming out of our mouth but the actual feeling of remorse that we're going to have so anyway in this verse that I just read you from my notes I wrote that this was a good response because the Israelites were mourning the potential loss of God's close presence. Remember, God has been with them through all of this. Close by, he was even in the pillar of the in the fire. He was with them in the wilderness. 
so he's always been really close with them and this is like them pushing him away and he's being cautious and he's kind of distancing himself from them they really to me need to make an effort to get close to him at this point I'm reading from my notes they really did care about their relationship with god and not only what he could give them and they probably did feel that the promise of an angel sent before before them was a lowering of the privilege that the people previously had with god because before god was actually his presence his presence was with them and now he's sending an angel as a substitute even though he's with them but he's not close by is what i what i what i understand from here so they took notice of this distancing that he made between him and themselves so remember the presence of the lord in the pillar of the cloud i spoke to you about that and the, the cloud of fire and day and fire by night so they definitely saw his presence and now they saw that it was removed and this probably caused some stress in their life because when they reflect on it they realize that all the things that god has done for them and how he fought battles for them and how they couldn't have done all the things that they did without god so this was probably a scary moment for them realizing that this presence was really not going to be amongst them this is a lesson for all of us to realize that what is the value of every blessing in your life if god is not going to be with you and what is the true value of all of your possessions if god is not going to be with you so that's something to think about here and i'm pretty sure that them reflecting on all of this they probably realized that the fellowship and the company of God was more important than all the possessions that they had. There's a reason why God uses certain words. So he used the word stiff-necked people. This is what it's translated from the Hebrew. So from my notes, I wrote that this term here is they were stubborn, but they were actually stubbornly resistant to God. It's like a picture of an ox and a donkey that's resisting the farmer making its step to be maneuvered so it's like have the wagon or whatever it is that they have in the back and you're trying to get this donkey to move forward and the donkey doesn't want to move and that's the resistance that is kind of shown in this wording here how you know the donkey will just like straight the you know because once the donkey is moved in the bridle he has to go that way but if he just stays stiff like that and just stays in one place he won't move that's kind of like what they're showing here and with this word about being stiff-necked so it gives you a visual about how stubbornly posed they were to some of the things that god was giving them okay verse number four and when the people heard these evil tidings they mourned and no man did put on him his ornaments. From my notes I wrote, this was a good response to the Israelites because this was bad news to them and they were going to be mourning God and the potential loss of God's nearby presence. So they really did care about their relationship with God and God was probably testing them. The other part of this was that this was a display of repentance and mourning about the jewelry and now wearing the ornaments and they wanted because they wanted to bring their hearts right with god and this was going to be their second step towards spiritual restoration and revival with god so in exodus 35 22 it talked about these ornaments that also well it we'll talk about it later but it talks about these ornaments ending ended up to build the tabernacle verse number five for the lord had said unto moses say unto the children of israel ye are a stiff-necked people and we just talked about what he's referring to with the stiff-necked people i will come up in the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee that i may know what to do unto thee verse number six and the children of israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the mount Harab. For my notes, I wrote that this was a temporary ban on jewelry and, and they were using it as a sign for repentance and mourning because of the loss of uh, God's fellowship. Verse number seven, and Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. 
And it came to pass that every one which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. For my notes, I wrote that this is the next step in their revival and restore, restoring the relationship with God. And it took an initiated effort to seek God by making his own tent of tabernacle and that's what Moses did and this was something that wasn't planned or strategized but it was radically and spontaneously sought and God probably considered it as a form of worship and like that because it was a form of repentance so by making the place of worship outside the camp there was a line that was drawn to see who really wanted to get close to God and it meant that everyone who wanted to see God had to separate. So from this, it is assumed by this verse that not everyone wanted to do this. So it was kind of a way to separate those who were willing to move towards God and those who were kind of sitting back on the fence. Verse number eight. And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. From my notes, I wrote that Moses prompted the people to draw close to God by his own example. And that's what he was showing here. And the people were watching and noticing when Moses worshipped. And it would be displayed by the pillar of the cloud. And it was probably a great comfort to them also to realize that their leader was actually meeting with God and hearing from him as well. The people rose and worshipped reference here is because they saw the relationship between Moses and God and he made others also want to worship God and it was a natural response which you will see coming up in the next verse uh, verse number 10 and all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door and all the people rose up and worshiped every man in his tent door Verse number 11, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again unto the camp, but, he, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. So in my notes I wrote that God and Moses spoke face to face in the tent of meeting. But it is known that Moses was not perfect he wasn't gifted or he was even powerful but God still spoke to him and Moses relied only on God's direction and friendship so if you go to numbers we won't read it today but if you go to numbers 12 8 it's going to clarify more uh, this uh, passage here so another thing is that Joshua was and eventually Joshua is going to take over for Moses later in future chapters in Deuteronomy later when Moses passes away. So Joshua is really being raised up to be the next leader. So and uh, Joshua was guarding the tent because there were curious people who were who would who would be daring enough to want to go inside and see this phenomenon. So he had to be there to guard this this entryway to the tent this lesson was a personal revival in Moses's life and it served as an example to the entire Israel nation especially to Joshua and it also drew Joshua close to God and so much so that Joshua did not depart from the tabernacle so I guess God was also using to raise him up as well because he knew that he was going to be the future leader verse number 12 and Moses said unto the Lord see thou sayest unto me bring up this people and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me yet thou hast said I know thee by name and thou hast also found grace in my sight so here Moses is pressing God for my notes I wrote this on 
the situation with his not being close to Israel. Verse number 13, Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in the sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. Verse number 14, And he said, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. The presence of God, from my notes, I wrote that means rest and peace in your life. And this was a necessary gift from God to Israel. And he, this is what he wanted to give them. But if you're in disobedience, this is why you have problems in your life. When you're walking with God, this is where you're going to find rest and peace. Verse number 15, And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. Verse number 16, For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, and I and thy people from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. From my notes I wrote that the presence of God and being close to God was something, and the forgiving of God, was something that was truly different from all the other nations. And this strong presence with God is what made them different. They, This is what made them totally different from all the nations around them and it was important for israel to know that they were different from all these other ancient people because of this powerful presence of their god and the relationship that god had with them and this is why they were considered unique from the other nations and they had to understand that and this is what is being shown here in these this chat in this chapter of the bible Verse number 17, And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Verse number 18, And he said, I beseech thee, shew me thy glory. Verse number 19, And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Verse 20, And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. 21, And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. In this uh, verse 21 here, from my notes I wrote that thou shalt stand upon a rock. In Kings 19, that's uh, chapter 19, verse 8 all the way to 18, Elijah met God supposedly here on this rock so you can go ahead and read that for yourself if you want to go over there verse 22 and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by that i will put thee in a cliff of the rock and will cover thee with my hand while i pass by verse 23 and i will take away mine hand and thou shalt see my back parts but my face shall not be seen my notes i wrote that the idea here is that moses could only see behind God and not God himself. So this is considered more like the after effects of his radiant glory when he passes by. That's kind of like what that's alluding to there. Now we're going to chapter 34, verse number 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tablets the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. So after the incident of the golden calf, God felt that now they were ready to get the laws again and they needed new stones so that he could go ahead and give them the laws again because the last set of laws that were on the stones, remember that Moses, when he came down the mountain, he was so angry at these people that he broke them. And that was a sign of the broken covenant that these people were making with God. And be ready in the morning and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount verse number three and no man shall come up with thee neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mount verse number four and he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up in unto Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tables of stone. 
Verse number five, and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So from my notes, I wrote that the cloud of glory is known as Shekinah in the Jewish. And this cloud is mentioned many times in the Bible. So that's a word that you're definitely going to want to remember. It's called Shekinah. Okay, verse number six, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord the Lord God merciful and gracious long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth for my notes I wrote that God gave Moses a vision of his love but not his power God's glory is revealed in his mercy his grace his compassion his faithfulness his forgiveness and justice and God strives for our character to also resemble his. Verse number seven, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will be by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. In my notes, I wrote that this signifies that no one would think there were some types of sin that God is unable to forgive. And that's what it's clarified here with the transgressions and the sins. So if God's love and forgiveness are rejected, God will punish. And the punishment comes with repercussions through the generations that end up hating him. So his loving, gracious, and giving character do not cancel out his righteousness and they are going to righteously be given to those who love him. Let's go on to verse number eight. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. You can see here that he was receiving everything that God was telling him. Verse number nine. And he said, if now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go amongst us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for thine inheritance so in this uh, in this verse here for my notes i wrote that moses here is asking for the goodness of god and the mercy of god to be extended to himself and the nation moses knew that he didn't deserve it but he asked for god's grace and not his justice so he wasn't just asking for justice he was asking for grace here's a lesson that we should ask god to be good to us if we know that god is a good and forgiving god we should be able to ask him to forgive us when we know him and it leads us to receive from him and he and moses also asked for them on behalf of his nation so that means you can also ask for that on behalf of other people verse number 10 and he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord. For it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. All right, let's talk about this here. In my notes, I wrote that God's plan was to glorify himself to all the nations and all the people to Israel and to show his glory to the great things he did amongst them this was an awesome thing because this was a promise that essentially that they knew that they were able to enjoy the blessings of the covenant through obedience verse number 11 observe thou that which I command thee for this day behold I drive out before thee the Amorites and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite verse number 12 take heed to thyself lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest lest it be for a snare on the midst of thee from my notes I wrote that God told them not to join the religious and sinful people around them to have absolute loyalty to God and exclusive devotion, something that we are also required to do as well. And you cannot serve God and money. So Christians that were making treaties with an enslaving God have to realize what is your first allegiance. This part here where it says in verse 13, and we'll get to that in a second. I just want to bring you briefly into that. 
it's called there's a reference here made to break their images which is in verse 13 is considered the sacred pillars and these were wooden poles um, these were sacred poles that stood by Baal's altar and they were called Asherah poles also used to worship the goddess and wife of Baal for fertility and agriculture and agricultural luck and there was a definite connection between the worship of the Canaanite gods and sexual immorality. Many of the Canaanite gods were fertility goddesses and they were used in worship by ritual prostitutes and sex during their worship. The culture of the Canaanites was so corrupt that it was beyond redemption and God didn't want Israel to assume any of the sinful practices found in that culture verse number 13 but ye shall destroy their altars break their images and cut down their groves number 14 for thou shalt worship no other god for the lord whose name is jealous is a jealous god verse number 15 lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they go a whoring after their gods and do sacrifice unto their gods and no one call thee and thou eat of his sacrifice Verse number 16, And thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a-whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a-whoring after their gods. Thou shalt make thee no molten gods. Verse number 18, The feast of unleavened bread shalt thou keep. Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, as I commanded thee in the time of the month Abib. For in the month Abib thou comest out from Egypt. All right, let's talk about this for a second. We already talked about this back when we were in the land of Egypt, where we were talking about all of these festivals. So this feast was about the purity that God desired for the nation of Israel. And remember, we talked about this before, that leaven is a symbol of sin, which was supposed to be put away. That's why you didn't have leavening in the bread. And it was symbolic of uh, Purit. Verse number 19, And all that openeth the matrix is mine, and every firstling among thy cattle, whether ox, sheep, that is male. Verse number 20, But the first leave of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. And if thou redeem him not, then, thou, then shalt thou break his neck. All the firstborn of thy sons thou shalt redeem, and none shall appear before me empty. 21, Six days thou shalt work, but on the seventh day thou shalt rest, and in earing time and in harvest thou shalt rest. Verse number 22. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. For my notes I wrote that God commanded that there were three feasts each year that they had to celebrate. That was the Passover, the Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacle. 23. Thrice in the year shall all your men, children, appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. 24. For I will cast out the nations before thee, and enlarge thy borders. Neither shall any man desire thy land. When thou shalt go up to appear before the Lord thy God thrice in the year. Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven, neither shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left unto the morning. Verse 26, The first of the first fruits of the land thy shall bring unto the house of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. Verse 27, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. Verse 28, And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote up upon the tablet the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So before we continue on, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about this. Uh, we already talked about that in a previous episode that about the, the the kids milk that you couldn't cook the baby lamb you couldn't cook with the milk of the mother and that was because that was that was evil it was considered evil that you would cook the baby of an animal in its mother's milk so just so you understand that so from this verse 28 though I did write that in my notes that this was going to be a supernatural fast 
and it was going to be remarkable for someone to live without food for 40 days remember uh, Moses is now up on this mountain we just read here and he is not going to eat bread or nor drink water for 40 days while these commandments are becoming developed and so it's considered a supernatural fast and without food and water for 40 days it's hard to survive for anyone but it was an account of the miracle that one could go without water for this long it's just never been repeated in the scriptures ever so this is a miracle that is being shown here to all of us that God can make something like this happen verse 29 and it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses hand when he came down from the mount that Moses was not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him verse number 30 and when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses behold the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come nigh him so let's talk about this situation here because there was a radiance in his face after he was with God for 40 days eating absolutely nothing so he was uh, this was a total 40-day fast no food and no water and when he came back he came with this glowing radiance so from my notes I wrote that the people could see God's radiance on uh, radiance on Moses after he spent time in directly in God's presence the people had walked away because the radiance of his face greatly intimidated them. What we have to learn from this is that time spent with God in prayer alone, reading the word and meditating will reflect on you to others. And that I think is the lesson here. Verse 31, And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. Verse 32, And afterward all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. Verse 33, And till Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. Verse 34, But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. So let's talk about this here in the presence of God from my notes I wrote he would take the veil off but with the people he would put the veil on his face verse 35 and the children of Israel saw the face of Moses that the skin of Moses's face shone and Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him now we're going into uh, we're going into chapter 35 which is a short chapter so we're going to get through it today verse number one and Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said unto them these are the words which the Lord hath commanded that ye should do them six days shall work be done but on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day a Sabbath of rest to the Lord whoever doth it work herein shall be put to death so this was this was a law you could not work on this day you would have death if you worked on this day so this principle holds true for a walk with God any anything we do this is from my notes and this is anything that we do for the Lord must grow out of our rest in him and rest we must have in his finished work on our behalf and this was a strict call to obedience so it's something that we have to also do we also have to take time to rest in the Lord verse number three ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day verse number four and Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel saying this is the thing which the Lord commanded saying five take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord who whosoever is of a willing heart let him bring it an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass. So from my notes, I wrote that God did not require this special offering, but he left it to those that had a generous heart. And our giving should come from love and generosity and not from a guilty conscience. Verse number six, and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood and oil for the light and spices for anointing oil and for the sweet incense and onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate 
Verse number 10, And every wise hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord hath commanded. For my notes I wrote that people were each recognized for their special ability. And we are all responsible to develop these abilities and to use them for God's glory. So we all have to work on those skills that God gives us. Verse number 11, the tabernacle, his tent, and his covering, his tashes, and his boards, his bars, his pillars, and his sockets. 12, the ark and the staves thereof, with the mercy seat and the veil of the covering, the table and his staves, and all his vessels, and the shoe bread, the candlestick also for the light of his furniture, and his lamps with the oil for the light, and the incense altar and his staves, and the anointing oil, and the sweet incense, and the hanging for the door at the entering of the tabernacle. Verse number 16, the altar of burnt offering with his brazen grate, he staves and all his vessels, the laver and his foot. Verse number 17, the hanging of the court, his pillars and their sockets and the hanging for the door of the court. The pins of the tabernacle and the pins of the court and their cords. The clods of service to service in the holy place. The holy garments for Aaron, the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister to the priest's office. And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. Verse 21, And they came, every one whose heart stirred him up, and every one whom his spirit made willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for all his service, and for the holy garment. Remember a few chapters back, we talked about this tent of meeting, which was the tabernacle. And we talked about the idea and all of the plans that God was revealing to them to build it. This now was the people actually giving for this tabernacle so Moses asked the people to give and he sent them home to decide what they would give and to give them the choice to choose what they wanted to give this wasn't some sort of manipulation where he said you have you, your nation has to give this and your remember we had several nations here of 12 tribes so your tribe had to give this and your tribe had to no this was Something decided amongst the people that had to come together and they had to decide what they were going to give. Also from my notes I wrote that many people generously responded to build up the tabernacle because the willingness of the people expanded and M Moses only that led them to give to what was needed. So when we learn from this, we know that no matter your job, God is very concerned, is going to be concerned with the beauty and the quality of the work that you do that should reflect your creative abilities that God has given you so when you go to work try to do your best job or whatever things that you are called to do for God or with the abilities that God has given you try to do your best work because they reflect on who you are and that you are a child of God verse 22 and they came both men and women as many as were willing hearted and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets all jewels of gold and every man that offered offered an offering of gold unto the Lord 23 and every man with whom was found blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goats hair and red skins of rams and badger skins brought them verse 24 every one that did offer an offering of silver and brass brought the Lord's offering and every man with whom was found shit and wood for any work of the service brought it Verse 25, And all the women that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands and brought that which they had spun, both of blue and of purple and scarlet and of fine linen. 26, And all the women whose hearts stirred them up in wisdom spun goat's hair. And the rulers brought onyx stone and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate, and spice and oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense. The children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord, every man and woman, whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. And Moses said unto the children of Israel, See the Lord had called by name Bezaleel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah. And he hath filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship, and to devise curious works to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in the cutting of stones to set them, and in carving of wood to make any manner of cunning work. And he hath put in his heart that he may teach both he and Haholiab, the son of Haishamach, of the tribe of Dan. Verse 35, Them hath he filled with wisdom of heart to work all manner of work of the engraver and of the cunning workmen, 
and of the embroiderer in blue and in purple and scarlet and in fine linen and of the weaver, even of them that to do any work and of those that devise cunning work. So from my notes here, as we get to the end of our Bible study for today, it's, it was, it is noted here that the workers, Basile, the workers, they had to follow what the Lord initially instructed them to do, but they could be creative in what they were doing. So God is a good God, and he put it in their spirit of how beautiful the work was going to be. So this is a wonderful story for all of us to try to do the best work that we can and send it to the Lord because he is the one that provides for us all our wonderful creative abilities to do things for him. So I thank you so much for watching. I invite you to bring your creative abilities unto the Lord, to reach out to Jesus Christ for repentance of your sins and to walk in faith for your salvation, for your be able to attain eternity with God to walk with him always and so that you can find rest and peace knowing that you are with him and no more drama in your life when you walk with him so you will be given spiritual discernment in order for you to be able to have that rest and peace in your life so I thank you so much for watching this week. I hope you all have a wonderful week. I will see you next week for my Bible study. Not sure if I'm going to do a midweek. I might. So stay tuned for that if I do. And um, have a wonderful week. God bless. Bye-bye.